attendance, I'll forget to record. It's one thing or the other. Um, so yeah, friendly reminder, if you could turn your cameras on so that I can see everyone and I don't feel like I'm just talking into the, the blackness of Zoom, um, that's much appreciated. And yeah, I have posted to the asynchronous material for this week, uh, the exam one study guide. It's just really sort of a loose look at what content will be on exam one, which is coming up next week on Monday. So next week on Monday, there will not be a synchronous meeting. And I've noted that on the course page, next week will be an async day and you will have all day to take your exam um, and the exam will be open for one hour. So sometime between 8 a.m. and midnight on that day, you need to be sure that you log in and you have an hour of time carved out to sit down and work your way through exam one. Uh, and of course, if you have test taking accommodations time, um, I will make the length of time that you need available to you. Uh, and I, I did want to maybe just open up that document where I've given you kind of the overview and just let people take a quick look at it and let me know if you have any burning questions or things that are unclear. Well, I have opened that document and it's not showing, there we go. Okay, so uh, the exam is gonna be comprised of multiple choice, matching and true false questions. Um, I do not recall off the top of my head how many questions there are and I apologize. Um, basically, we're just going through chapters one through four and these key concepts, those theoretical frameworks. So if you remember that group grid activity that we did in class, that will be probably the best way to look back at that because it's practical applications and real life scenarios that help us see how those theoretical frameworks um, can interpret or help us sort of understand relationships and things like that. Uh, polyamory, which is the concept of uh, multiple loves and um, related ideas to that. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about Sternberg's triangular view of love, uh, the components that, that make that up. And there's a handout on As You Learn that you can use to look back on that. Uh, different types of love. So these are like um, mania, mania um, eros, those different types of love that we went over. And then um, storage type of love, th those different types. We talked about attachment theory and how that shows up in love relationships. You guys did an async uh, activity on the different love languages. And then last week when we met, we talked about gender and diversity and some issues related to that. So you need to know those key definitions that we went through um, and understand some of those theories that help us interpret um, gender and diversity and relationships. And then this last bit is, is some stuff that we're gonna talk about today because today we're looking at singlehood um, and then ideas of living together and living apart together, being together, living apart. Anything that you do not know what I'm talking about or you want some clarification on while we're here. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, so now if everybody will take a minute and type your first and last name into the chat and that way I will have a record of your being here today. And while you all are working on that, I'm gonna get today's PowerPoint going for us. Okay, so as I said, today we're gonna to be talking about some issues related to staying single. 
Um, and then some ideas about cohabitation, living together. And then there's also this sort of new trend of people um, in committed relationships or even marriages that are together but living apart. Um, also gonna talk about some millennial trends. Uh, the text calls these hanging out and hooking up. And then um, also some ideas related to long distance relationships and what those entail for people. So singlehood, basically uh, this term is often associated with young people who have not yet been married. They're referred to, you know, obviously as being single, uh, but there are, there are three kind of key types of singles that you need to recognize. The first is that group that I just mentioned, they have not ever been married. Um, and then the other two singlehood categories are divorcees, people who were married but are not any longer, and then people who um, were widowed are also referred to technically as singles, um, but you know might also fall into those other categories. It often depends on who's asking and um, if they kind of block you into single or you know divorced, never married, widowed, those types of things. So um, there are some current issues and trends that are brought out in the text about singlehood. The first is this, this idea of sologamy. Did anyone um, read and, and does anyone remember what that term refers to? Um, doesn't it mean when you like kind of want to marry yourself? Yeah, so the, the textbooks describes an individual who, um, after being, I guess, a little frustrated with having to always answer these questions around her singlehood, um, in terms of like, you know, why have you made this decision? Why haven't you found someone? Um, that Those types of questions. And we'll talk a little bit later about some stereotypes and kind of negative um, associations with staying single. But she, because of that uh, sort of societal view of singlehood, decided to engage in a civil ceremony where she married herself and, and just committed to um, that life of, of staying single and being really um, committed to herself. I don't know how common that is. Um, this in the text was the first that I had ever heard of this idea, but um, just to make you aware that it is a thing and um, it's called sologamy if you enter into civil union with oneself. Uh, if you guys would take just a minute and type some ideas into the chat so that we can talk these out. But this, this current trend or an issue in, in marriage relationships is that many folks nowadays are delaying marriage. So, you know, historically, um, and just even a few decades ago, people were getting married as early as, you know, 18 and 19 and really embarking on their adult life already in a committed married relationship. That is no longer the case. The trend now is more towards the late 20s and even into you know, the 30s and 40s. People are delaying marriage and family. What are your ideas on why that is occurring? Just type them into the chat so that I can use that as a springboard for conversation. Someone said education, so people continuing on in higher ed and it taking um, longer in terms of the lifespan time. Financial and emotional security. People are wanting those things before they get married. Jobs, um, people being afraid of divorce. Yeah, the, the outlook on marriage in our society is somewhat grim at this point. Um, so that could certainly be a factor the cost of living. So that's an interesting one because I think it's double-sided in that, um, and, and we'll talk about sometimes people, you know, enter into cohabitating relationships or even marriages because of the economic benefit. Um, but that's also, and I noticed someone in the discussion for this week that had already posted early said, you know, that doesn't seem like a very good idea for um, starting a relationship off based on, you know, shared finances. 
um, money is a big issue right now. And so people are not financially stable or secure enough to feel like they can um, support the partnership. Um, money, I think, is probably the one that I see coming up most often. And then someone says this idea of people wanting to be able to live their own lives before starting a family. Um, I definitely think that that is part of it. And actually, so my undergraduate um, work was in psychology and, you know, we look at all the different phases of development um, and it used to be basically, you know, infancy, toddlerhood, childhood, adolescence into adulthood. And in the last um, decade or so, they have actually added a category in there called um, extended adolescence. And so it, it's that period of time between like 18 and whatever is considered full adulthood where we're in college, we are doing that living of our own lives. Um, and then maybe even into graduate school, you know, but there's a chunk of, of probably five to five to 10 years even on the table now that is looked at um, as kind of this middle ground between adolescence and adulthood. And I think people are not necessarily getting married in that, um, that time span for many of the reasons that we just listed. And so does someone have a question? Singleism, uh, the term that I've got listed here, that is the idea that I was referring to in that first point about sologamy. Singleism is stereotypes, stigmas, discrimination against those who choose to stay single throughout their lives. Um, and, and this is reflected on a personal level, but also there are institutional policies like workplace, um, family-friendly policies, benefits, health insurance, those type of things that don't necessarily extend to people um, who are living a single life as compared to those who are married. So uh, it can be at kind of a structural policy level as well, this idea of singleism. Uh, now we're looking at the dating relationships um, and, and changes that have occurred in the idea of dating, um, particularly around millennials um, and, and like the you know, most recent generation of folks who are embarking on dating. So the reasons for getting involved with a partner have even, um, have even sort of shifted. And, and this is just a basic overview of like, what is the point of this type of relationship, a uh, romantic relationship, partnering with someone in life um, that would eventually, you know, possibly lead to a marriage relationship. The first is this idea of confirmation of social self. And this is related back to, if you remember um, those theoretical frameworks, we talked about one in particular called symbolic interaction framework, where we in relationship with other people come to better understand ourselves. Um, there was a concept in there called the looking glass self. And that is that, you know, my partner's assessment of me as um, funny in that they laugh at my jokes helps me recognize that I might be funny, you know, in the broader societal experience. And so that influences how I behave with other people. So that's kind of one of the, the real fundamental functions of partner involvement is confirmation of the social self. The second idea is related to just having fun together, right? So there are recreational benefits to being involved with another person in this committed sort of way. And the third point, pretty straightforward, uh, relationships like this, partner involvement offer security and connection to one specific person in the larger social world through companionship, intimacy, um, physical sex, all of those ideas. <clears throat> the idea of anticipatory socialization refers to um, relationships giving us a context for learning how to be a partner in a relationship. So even if I know that I'm not going to marry someone, 
I might still choose to stay in a committed relationship with them for some length of time because it's like practice, if you will, for something coming later on. Um, and again, you know, it offers me all these other benefits. And so uh, even if I'm looking at it as this is just anticipatory for a relationship coming, um, there's some, some social benefit to that. Status achievement, this is related back to that idea of singleism in that, uh, you know, there's this kind of notion that if you don't have this type of partner relationship that you're missing out on something in life. Sometimes it's just conforming to social norms, um, trying to please family members. Um, and, and I think, you know, at like a sort of I don't, I don't know what the, the word that I'm looking for, like a, a overarching conscience in our society is that you will have greater life satisfaction if you, if you do indeed secure a long-term partner involvement. And then at a very basic level, mate selection is how we as a, as a species um, procreate. And so, you know, dating someone, seeing someone regularly could in fact lead to marriage, which could eventually lead to reproduction. Um, certainly don't have to have those pieces in place, but I think that's kind of, again, one of those like stereotypical societal functions of um, dating relationships and partner involvement. Uh, so some trends that we've noticed in the past 70 years, I've already mentioned that the age of marriage has increased as people are delaying marriage more and more. The dating pool has broadened. Um, part of this is related to the internet and you know social networking sites, social media, those type of things, because now instead of only having access to the people who are in Boone, North Carolina, while I'm in Boone, North Carolina, I basically have access to the entire world at large, um, you know, in some capacity. So the dating pool has broadened and also there are more available individuals because of that delay of marriage. More people are living single into their late twenties and thirties. And so there are more people um, kind of in the dating pool. Cohabitating, which we're gonna spend some more time talking about has become more socially normed. So. It used to be looked at as, you know, something that was somewhat taboo in our society, um, and it wasn't as often done. There are economic reasons, there are logistical reasons um, that we will get into that that have created this more normed um, view of cohabitation. More egalitarian gender role relationships. So this relates back to some stuff that we've already talked about in terms of gender role ideology, um, the ways that society expects men or and or women in a relationship to behave, um, their roles and responsibilities. But those have kind of leveled out to a more even playing field, and and that's just a trend that you know can be acknowledged in this idea of dating and and partner relationships. And then we've also seen safer sex practices between both genders, which, you know, um, kind of contributes to some of these ideas of, um, you know, being able to date for longer, uh, not marrying and entering into, um, you know, family roles, all of that can in some ways relate back to these safer sex practices. Part of what we're seeing in millennials and, and Gen Zers um, is hanging out, hooking up, and even long distance relationships are more common now. So hanging out is really just this um, idea of, you know, going out in groups with the intent of having fun, meeting other people, but there's no level of uh, commitment um, not even really the intent to, to partner with someone. It's just about, you know, being together in the group, hanging out, um, hooking up, hooking up is where, you know, there is a sexual encounter between two individuals who might've been hanging out in that larger group. But again, there's no expectation for a relationship. 
Um, I think there's a, a popularized term now, a situationship. Um, but you know, these are all ideas related to to this notion of hooking up. Um, it's casual and sexual. And then the text defines long distance relationships, which I said are becoming more common as a romantic relationship with someone who's at least 500 miles away. Um, and again, you know, I think that we're seeing this be more possible because of technology. Um, and so it wasn't always the case that you could stay connected to someone, um, you know, emotionally and, and, and like with FaceTime and, you know, face chat options now you can basically be in someone's home virtually um in in a way that just really wasn't possible even several years ago um and so i think you know there's just lots of sort of societal trends that are lending to this idea of long distance relationships but they're largely um successful and and fairly common nowadays so cohabitation is this idea of living together as you know relationship partners um, and sometimes for the long term we'll talk about people who choose not to get married um, and and are just you know indefinite cohabitators but the book outlines um, these different sort of types of cohabitation and i want you to have a general understanding of what each of these kind of looks like feels like so here and now cohabitators, the first on the list, these are partners who are having fun in the relationship um, and, and they're really not focused on the future. They are just kind of living for the here and now, if you will, uh, and they've decided to live together for you know um, whatever reason suits them, but it's a very uh, present focused cohabitation, not necessarily looking towards marriage. People who are called testers, um, I'll give you the analogy here that you probably wouldn't drive a car off the lot and purchase it without taking it for a test drive. So these are people who are testing this cohabitation lifestyle in a forward thinking way that, you know, if I'm going to live with this person and eventually marry them, um, I need to make sure that our lifestyles work out, that our rhythms and, um, you know, all the things that go into partnership for life, that, that it's a good match. So they are testing the waters in this way of living together to see, is it going to be a good fit? People who are engaged are obviously already planned to be married. Um, and then, and for whatever reason, they have decided to embark on living together, you know, before that commitment ceremony. Um, but these people tend to have, in terms of cohabitators, the highest level of satisfactions and the lowest level of conflict in their relationships compared to other types of cohabitators. So um, these people, you know, they're kind of already living in that fully committed marital partnership type of way, again, just without the official ceremony um, at this point. So money savers, number four, this is related to that financial piece where it becomes a living arrangement that is economically convenient. Um, researchers have noted that working class individuals tend to make the decision to partner in a cohabitation living arrangement more quickly than middle class individuals. Uh, and again, this is primarily because, you know, the cost of rent split between two people is more affordable than the cost of rent assumed by one person. And sometimes it just makes sense, you know, especially if you're spending a large amount of time sleeping at another person's house and you're paying rent in one, you know, in your own place, like from a financial standpoint for a lot of people that just doesn't make sense. And so they embark on cohabitation living just because of the, the financial and economic benefit. Number five is called pension partners, and these couples are older. They have already been married, and they're deriving some sort of financial benefit from a previous marriage, so they opt out of marrying a new partner, um, and they just cohabitate in a way to, again, make it financially advantageous for themselves. 
or their partner. Uh, number six is kind of a related idea in terms of alimony maintenance. So sometimes people who have been in a previous marriage and have divorced, they're drawing a type of money called alimony from the previous partner and engaging or embarking on a new marriage would upset that, uh, that flow of income. And so in order to maintain their current alimony funding, they choose not to marry a new partner and they cohabitate. Um, without Mary. The idea of security blankets is just this notion that some people can't live by themselves. They need another individual in the home. They need a partner in their bedroom um, just to help them, you know, not feel like they're alone. And so uh, regardless for these people, regardless of kind of the level of intensity of their relationship, they choose to cohabitate with a partner really as sort of a security blanket to have another person with them. Rebellious couples, these are those who use cohabitation as a way to establish independence from their family of origin. So they are ready to move out, make their own decisions, uh, and really oftentimes, you know, don't have families who are supportive of cohabitating relationships. And so they do it kind of as a way to assert their independence in their adult life. And then there's also this last group called marriage nevers. These are people who have uh, concerns about kind of the societal pressure around marriage they don't necessarily buy into these ideals of marriage and they also sometimes have a fear of how marrying their partner might impact the dynamics of their relationship so they choose to just say i you know i want to be with this person i want to live with this person and build a life with them but i do not want to marry them and that is another type of cohabitating relationship do these all make sense and seem pretty straightforward to you in terms of how you understand them? I have a question. Um, so what's like the major difference between pensions, pension partners and alimony maintenance? Yes, uh, so pension partners, um, this might be like if I, it's really related to that alimony piece so if i were married to someone and they and we divorced and we're like retirement age they would be required to give me a portion of their income and sometimes that's just in the form of pension or retirement drawings um and and those types of like benefits that you receive later on in life and so if i married a new partner i would no longer necessarily um depending on you know income and stuff like that i would no longer potentially i would no longer be eligible to draw uh the the pension and the retirement type of money that my partner was making and then alimony you know alimony is a specific amount of funding that the court deems that you have to pay at, at the point of um divorce for like helping support you know living expenses and things like that um and so it's really just kind of nuanced in terms of what type of funding the person would be uh, eligible for from that previous relationship. Does that help clear it up? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or thoughts on any of these? So there were uh, some researchers, <clears throat> Ortel and others, did a long-term study on cohabitators just in the interest of understanding kind of the, the why behind their decision to, to live this way. And uh, these are some, it's six themes that kind of emerged from this research. Um, 38% of the, the folks that were interviewed in this research 
felt that marriage was unnecessary to their happiness as a couple. So this is kind of related to those marriage never people. They just really don't want, you know, what comes from a marriage relationship and they don't necessarily think it will be beneficial to their relationship. So they choose, uh, you know, marriage free lifestyles. Risk aversion was another theme. Uh, this is where people perhaps related to someone's sharing of being afraid of divorce. They have seen that marriage does not always have a positive outcome for people in their experience. And so they're trying to avoid, you know, the disaster of divorce, um, discontent in the home, all of those type of things um, that maybe they witnessed in another family member or a friend. Uh, some people just boycott marriage in that they are rejecting the government's definition of marriage as a heterosexual, heterosexual only um, partnership. Oftentimes, these are people who are taking a stance as allies with the LGBTQIA community, um, and they, you know, they just boycott marriage for um, kind of societal reasons, rejecting the societal norms around marriage. Um, this idea of sexism dissent is related to a feminist approach. Um, and, and really this, this kind of um, feminist interpretation of marriage as being related to the patriarchy, the history of um, men in power and um, controlling women through marriage relationships. So a sexism dissent is one of the reasons that people might give for their choosing to cohabitate and not marry. Some people were called the American dreamer. This again came up uh, pretty significantly in our chat discussion. So people are um, you know, wanting to pay off their student loans, establish a career, have financial and sort of life security before they marry a partner. And, um, and so they're cohabitating with someone, but they're kind of trying to live out that American dream before they commit to marriage. And then the idea of economic disincentives is that um, sometimes we're in relationship with people who maybe have more student loan debt than we have, or more credit card debt than we have, or just are not financially viable as a partner. And so in an effort to protect ourselves financially from taking on that person's, um, you know, financial burden or whatever, we choose to be in partnership with them, but not to, um, you know, commit to a marriage relationship with them purely from a financial standpoint. And, you know, there's nothing saying that you have to join bank accounts with someone when you marry them, um, but there is a level of responsibility, shared responsibility for things like debt, um, and, and such that you do take on just from a legal standpoint when you marry someone um, because of that sort of legal binding contract. All right. So just kind of basically to, to give you a, a sense of advantages, disadvantages, benefits, um, drawbacks to this idea of cohabitating. Um, compared to uninvolved individuals or people in a relationship but not living together, cohabitants in committed relationships do tend to report a general sense of well-being in their relationships and their life satisfaction as it relates to this uh, romantic relationship. The longer a person waits to get married, the better the outcome for their relationship tends to be. So cohabitating effectively delays the marriage timeline, which has implications and, um, you know, could result in more positive outcomes for the marriage relationship. Obviously, cohabitating allows for more intimate knowledge of oneself and one partner because you've already come to discover, you know, that your partner leaves the cabinet door half open um, or compulsively makes the bed every morning and you know whether or not that's going to work for you in terms of long-term living arrangements. Um, and so it's, you know, easier to know oneself and one's partner 
if you've cohabitated for any length of time. And then related to the idea of safety, this is primarily about women who are living in cohabitating situations, but um, there's this kind of idea that having another person in the home, particularly a male, might serve as a deterrent for someone who was going to break into the home, um, you know, commit some sort of uh, assault or whatnot towards the woman living alone. Of course, this could also happen in a group setup where you're living with roommates and such, but there is kind of an element of safety um, that is thought to exist in a cohabitating relationship. And there are also drawbacks. As compared to people who are married, people who cohabitate tend to have more relationship problems um, and then higher dissolution or breaking up. Um, higher levels of, of the relationship ending is another way to say higher levels of dissolution. So, you know, there is something to be said, I think, from a, um, a commitment standpoint about the ceremony and all that goes into a marriage, making it a legal contract as compared to just living together. Um, it does tend to keep people in those relationships longer and happier. Um, with fewer problems if you're married. So this idea of feeling used or tricked, it's basically when expectations of the relationship differ, the more invested partner might walk away from this cohabitating living arrangement as, um, you know, feeling if they've been tricked or duped in the relationship. <clears throat> This living arrangement of cohabitating does not often, it, it often does not mesh with the older generation's values. You know, we mentioned at the beginning of the call that there's been this shift towards more normed and more acceptance of cohabitation. So sometimes it creates problems with one's family of origin if you're choosing to cohabitate with a partner. Um, there are some financial liabilities in terms of economic disadvantages. So an example of that is that choosing to cohabitate rather than marry often doesn't qualify a partner for um, those benefits like health insurance, social security, retirement benefits. So there can be economic disadvantages to choosing this lifestyle. And then in terms of impact on children, about 40% of children spend some time in a home with cohabitating adults. And these children are thus more likely to experience the breakup of a parent's relationship as compared to children in the home because of the item number one, where we see, you know, these relationships um, devolve and, and cease to exist more often than married relationships. And so this type of experience in you know, being in the home through the breakup can have, um, you know, negative impacts on children. It can result in maladjusted children, um, teenagers who engage in delinquent behaviors often, more often come from um, homes where there has been, you know, a, a breakup of parental or um, those types of relationships. So it does have impacts on other people in the family. And then just to kind of touch on some legal aspects, common law marriage, that is the term that is, it was a historical idea, but it is um, still recognized in 14 states that, you know, if you have cohabitated for a long enough period of time, and this is defined state by state, um, I know in North Carolina, it used to be seven years, and I'm not sure if that's still a law on the books, but um, that's just kind of the general idea that if you've lived with a partner for seven years or more, then you would be recognized as common law married. And that um, entitles partners in that relationship to like financial and legal um, supports if the relationship, you know, ends. Um, and so you do have to present like significant proof of life together for that period of time. But uh, a term that I want you to know called palimony, it's kind of a take off the word alimony. Um, it's the term that has been coined to refer to the amount of money that one partner cohabitating with another um, might have to pay or, or the other partner might be entitled to if things break up, um, even though they're not married 
it, it's, you know, if the relationship is recognized by law, you would still have to pay this um, palimony type of alimony. Uh, sometimes child support is still a legal um, binding issue, even if people, you know, in partnership, just cohabitating, not married, if they are raising children together <clears throat> and the relationship ends, child support is still on the table as a requirement for, for a partner to pay. Um, and then child inheritance and custody issues can come into play. Um, you might be as a child entitled to an inheritance from both parents um, and then usually custody is, is granted to the biological parent and or the parent um, who, you know, is most involved with the child. Um, but these are some sort of tricky legal, you know, pieces that have to be navigated um, in cohabitating relationships where children are involved. <clears throat> and I just want to spend a few minutes touching on this idea of living apart together. Um, this again is a trend that we're seeing become more and more common. Basically it's a couple committed relationship, often married where partners are living in separate households. Uh, right now there are 1.7 million married couples living in this way. Um, that's based on us census bureau data. And this is not a new phenomenon, but it's certainly one that I think is, is happening um, more and more often. Again, related to some of those ideas that we talked about with long distance relationships, technology just makes it possible. Um, we have a friend who uh, married a woman from Japan. Um, they were living together in Portland, Oregon. Um, and recently, because of COVID is a factor and she had some family things going on, she has gone back to Japan. He is living here right now. Um, and he was at our house for dinner last night and we were, you know, FaceTiming with her. So like, it's not the same, but in a way, you know, she's part of his social experience. Um, she's very connected to our family and our children, even though she's in Japan. Um, and there's a day and a half time difference on the table, it can be done, you know, and um, there are some very clear reasons why people might choose to live this way. Uh, some advantages related to space and privacy. Um, sometimes people have like funky, um, you know, work hours. I used to babysit for a child and uh, her dad was like an ER doctor. They had, they actually had a really interesting setup for this idea of living apart together, but they had a home and then an adjacent guest house that he used the guest house when he was working night shift and needed to sleep during the day. Um, so they kind of had that built into their one home, but, but sometimes people might choose to have two separate, completely separate living spaces so that they can, you know, adjust their sleep schedules and things to their own needs. Um, sometimes this is in the form of social needs that I, as my, you know, I am more extroverted. I like to be um, out with people or having people over um, and my partner simply does not. And so in order to accommodate, you know, those different needs, uh, we choose to be in partnership, but live separately. Sometimes it's related to family circumstances. Like if you already have children from a previous marriage, um, allergies is a, an item that people have listed as you know, a reason for living apart together. Um, some people just think that it keeps the relationship fresher. Uh, and I've got a video, just a simple video posted to the asynchronous content for uh, Wednesday that will give you kind of a, another bird's eye look on this idea. So I'd like you to watch that. It, it gives you um, one couple's perspective on how this living arrangement benefits their marriage. Um, and here are some other ideas of, you know, how this could be beneficial. And then just briefly, um, some drawbacks, they're pretty obvious, you know, you might feel less connected to your partner in that you're not, you know, sharing a life with them per se, but just seeing them maybe on the weekends or, you know, sometimes during the week. <coughs> um, cost, you know, you're maintaining two living places rather than just one. 
Um, there could be an inconvenience factor. Someone in the, I think in the video that I posted mentions, like if I have to drive home from work and then I have to get home from work and drive over to my wife's house, you know, that's just, there's a whole nother piece in there than coming home from work and sharing dinner together in the same home. Um, you do not have this same sense of shared history uh, because you're not, you know, completely sharing life and living together in this type of relationship. And um, there might be issues related to legal protection, um, especially if you're maintaining two separate homes um, and that type of thing. So clear benefits for some people, um, some clear drawbacks, you know, that this living arrangement might um, provide for folks, but it is something to be aware of um, because it is again happening more and more often. I think it's, um, there are some celebrities that have been very successful in living married lives together apart um, for a good length of time. So it, it does work for some people. And I think uh, this wraps us up in terms of content for the first exam. So again, get prepared for that. Um, there is a quick reflection that you need to complete for this week. Again, watch the video, complete the reflection. And the reflection can be specific to the video or some other content that was brought out of um, today's talk or the chapter that you read. So you don't have to limit it just to the video. Um, but I've given you a prompt in the way that I want you to reflect on this content. And then please review the ideas listed on that exam study guide to prepare for next week on Tuesday when we will not meet. Make a note, we do not meet. We just have the exam posted online. Questions, concerns? Um, I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, so it's actually about the reflections though. Um, I know that's due to, at the midterm, but what date is the midterm? Yes, uh, for this class meeting on Monday, I believe it's February the 28th, which is that Monday. Um, and let me, I think I've posted that ahead, but so I know your reflections are due that day. Um, yeah, and then the midterm is actually gonna fall on the following, like on Wednesday, um, but, but your reflections do need to be turned in by that Monday. The 28th. Okay. And then I saw that on the page, it only showed the six through 10 ones. Like there was the one to five reflections, but then I didn't see that again. Hmm. Let me look. Uh, so I've moved that. And while we're on that, the, the submit reflections assignment link, I moved down to week eight when it will be due. Um, oh, okay. And that might be why you're, yeah because I, I was in here last night um, adding to the course and I just went ahead and put that down on the date where it will be posted. But if you go into that link where it says uh, the reflection assignment due at the midterm is items one through five. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I meant to say that at the beginning of the call, I just kind of forgot. Any other questions related to those written reflections that are coming up due or anything else midterm? I mean, exam one or current content? Nope. Okay. Thank you so much for being. Question. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so is the three, two, one reflection the same as the one, three, five reflection or are those two completely different reflections? Uh, the, the one through five are the written pieces that you're going to do throughout the course. Um, there are 10 of them all together, five of them before the midterm. And if you maybe missed that from like the first class call or such, I can stay on with you and just kind of walk you through it really quickly. Um, but the reflection, the three, two, one reflection is just a weekly asynchronous assignment for this week. Uh, sometimes those are posted in the form of you know, discussion forums on the course page. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, if you don't have any other questions, you can hop off. And if you want to stay on and chat with me about any of that stuff that we just touched on, I'll be here for a few more minutes.